Sky High is not a subversion of fascist utopian rhetoric. It's just a literal depiction of it. As if we just realized 10 minutes from the end that, oh shit, we just made our movie propaganda for the oppressive anti-feminist bourgeois elites of the 18th century. Quick, make it empowering at the end so they won't notice. Here, for what else but to ruthlessly declare everything you once loved as toxic, cancelled, to expose the receipts. You see this? This is exactly what I warned you about. Way back when, all those months ago. Soy boy NPC cucks, wrapping their paws around the media we all know and love, infesting it with their degenerate ideology. Like locusts, viewers. Like locusts, they swarm every innocent movie and video game they can. Wanna go see Aquaman? Excuse me. Don't you mean neo-Nazi dog whistling? How about a quick read of Heart of Darkness? Well, I'm sorry. Apparently it's actually post-colonial racism. Nothing is safe, viewers. And you just be careful, or the things you love will be next on the platter. Did you ever notice how Beverly Hills Chihuahua and 12 Years a Slave are basically the same movie? Okay, sure. Let's be honest, there are a lot of little details that clearly distinguish between these two movies. For instance, we're all aware that in 12 Years a Slave, our main character is forced into servitude in the Deep South. But in Beverly Hills Chihuahua, they're in Mexico. And yes, of course, in 12 Years a Slave, they're kidnapped and taken down south, where in Beverly Hills Chihuahua, they initially go south for a vacation. They're set in different time periods, and 12 Years a Slave does not feature a wacky Hispanic dog as the film's love interest. And finally, one is a real story about an actual person during a time of horrific persecution. And one is about a talking dog being held for ransom in Mexico City. But let's make no bones about it, these skeletons here are fundamentally the same. Living in relative comfort in a nation where a deep systemic oppression is taking place among your people, ripped from your home and sent south to a colony wherein you are reduced to property, forced to live the life you had long tried to avoid, protect identifying information, and eventually alert your community to your situation and find your way back home to your loving family. Now you may ask, Jack, why? What is the purpose behind this? Is there any actual meaning behind making this kind of gross, thoughtless comparison? Why? Well... Sometime in the 1920s, Sigmund Freud was quoted as saying, Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. A coy remark referencing the desire by fans of his to read subconscious impulses and desires into every possible object or circumstance. Except, actually, that quote was probably made up by someone else because they were too much of a coward to admit that no, actually a cigar is never just a cigar and sometimes that cigar is in fact a partially animated talking dog. You know how you might have gone to your cousins, maybe your niece or your nephew, and then you end up bunging on a movie like this? You can really understand me. Yep. And like, you watch it for a while, and then from your adult perspective, you start to maybe think more about the mechanics of the worlds in these movies. Now, obviously these movies aren't usually designed to be read into quite so much. Kids aren't going to notice it, probably not a lot of parents either. But when you do read it, there's something there. It's like playing a really buggy game and realizing some oddly fun mechanics you can make out of exploiting the bugs. If you take this genre of movies that set up these strange alternative universes, sometimes even want to make some kind of pointed social commentary, but also really, really don't have a desire to take the mechanics of these worlds to their logical conclusion, 
you start to see some pretty interesting stuff. And hey, maybe there's even a lesson to be learned from examining the material in this awful, awful way. And what else am I gonna do? This is my brand, I think. So let's give Talking Dog movies the true rigour of academic analysis they've long been sorely in need of. And before we kick off, the criteria we're looking at today is live action Talking Dog family movies. Animated furry movies ain't getting counted here. They're great, but it's fair to say they have their own genre tropes worth looking at. And similarly, we're avoiding the little known live action non-Talking Dog movie, since the dogs in those are kind of just dogs. No matter how many sports they play, sorry Airbud. Although technically, as of the Air Buddy spin-off film, it does turn out Air Bud is capable of speech, and as a pup star, humans are capable of understanding them in that world. So, Beverly Hills Chihuahua. <laughs> Beverly Hills Chihuahua tells the story of Chloe, a pampered purebred Chihuahua living the high life in. I guess, some kind of rich neighborhood in California. Aside from the occasional interruptions of her pesky Latino-coded neighbor, Puppy, she pretty much lives the dream life, her every possible whim and desire met under the ownership of fashion designer Viv. End of Act 1 conflict. Viv goes on vacation, leaving her prima donna niece Rachel to take care of the mansion and, by extension, Chloe. Rachel takes this opportunity to take a walk on the wild side and head down with some pals to an undersun beach resort in Mexico. While there, Chloe gets chucked in a bag and dognapped by a, a gang of Mexican criminals who lock Chloe up to serve the whims of their paying customers by taking part in dogfights. At the same time, they're planning on ransoming her off, which seems contradictory to the dogfight thing, but Whatever, she escapes with the help of retired police dog Delgado, and together they escape Mexico City and find their way home. Now, there are many ways you can read the general arc of this narrative. Most obviously, it's kind of a class thing. Chloe lives a life of LA decadence, and then she's suddenly thrown into the dog-eat-dog life of a stray in urban Mexico. She starts out woefully naive to the realities of her world, begins to realize the things she thought mattered maybe don't so much, and all of this culminates in a moment towards the end of the film, wherein Chloe realizes maybe there are more important things in a dog's life than their access to frilly booties. There's also a kind of unavoidable racial component here. The class separations in this film are universally also denoted by racial distinctions, with Viv as well as Rachel and her socialite friends all being white Americans, while the criminals, the strays, and even Rachel's gardener Sam are either Hispanic or coded Your as such. Your dog is muy bad. Muy, muy, muy bad. Mucho naughty. So we can say, look, Here's a straightforward representation of how the talking dogs in this story are being used to discuss wider social issues. And there's a little ambition here to really comment on our society, rather than just talking dog do a poo. Gross. <laughs> Guilty. Don't judge others by the color of their skin, nor the size of their wallet. Good. Now, that framing device. You see good doggos, but the capitalist sees commodity. What does the free market have to say about this one? Every talking dog movie has its own special way of justifying its premise, which you kind of have to try and do, at least a little bit, because... Okay, you know where I'm going with this, right? Like, in the mechanics of all of these worlds, the dogs are not just dog smart, but at a near human level of intelligence. They have language, and they can have complex thoughts, feelings, hopes, dreams, regrets. I mean, don't get me wrong, dogs are clever in the real world too, but often in these movies it's feasible, if not demonstrated, that these pups are fully capable of maintaining their own advanced society. Usually they can understand humans, even if humans can't understand them, and sometimes they even can communicate back and forth and humans own them, like, as pets. And the dogs call humans masters and are super loyal and protective of that relationship. 
And if you take that narrative to its conclusion, surely you're either going to tell a story in which the dogs free themselves from the servitude of humans, or you're kind of telling a story that normalizes indentured servitude? To date, there is only one dog movie I've found that actually tackles this problem so straightforwardly, White God, which isn't for kids and also the dogs don't talk, but nonetheless tells the story of dogs getting fed up with humans, rising up and demanding their freedom. I know this is Animal Farm 2, but I'm talking about movies right now, not books. I know there's a book movie adaptation, just... Very occasionally you'll get a talking dog movie that at least acknowledges this relationship, such as 2003's Good Boy, but it always kind of ends up being hand waved away as, well we like humans and they treat us well, so if anything we're better off being treated as property rather than free to act on our own desires. Which is a justification you could probably spend just hours thinking about. And then, oftentimes, you'll get a Beverly Hills Chihuahua, a story that literally hinges on a dog being taken, stripped to their freedom and individuality, and treated as property to be used as desired by their master, who then runs home so they can continue to be treated as property, but just, you know, in a nice way. This is a bit of a diversion, but I did watch the other two Beverly Hills Chihuahua films, just so nobody could catch me out and say, ah, but in the third one, dogs are actually fully emancipated and there's a whole court case subplot and... So I did that, and no, actually the other two really say nothing new in terms of what I'm specifically talking about today. But I did watch them, uh, and I have some things to say, mostly about the second one, and now's probably the only chance I have to talk about it, because... I'm not doing a whole video just about the Beverly Hills to our sequels. What do I look like? In the second movie, Poppy and Chloe have gotten together, and even had some pups, and it's Sam's job to take care of them while Rachel and Viv go away to... research undiscovered healing plants in Central Africa. This movie is actually about the housing crisis. Sam's first generation immigrant parents are failing to meet rising mortgage payments and are being threatened by the bank to foreclose the home they've been living in since Sam was a child. They apparently can't just ask multi-millionaire heiress Rachel for some money because pride or integrity or something. There's a plan to win a dog show to raise the money the bank demands, which falls through because puppy isn't a purebred, and then the dogs end up helping Delgado's twin sons take down a team of notorious bank robbers. This inexplicably nets the family a hefty cash reward in the last five minutes of the film, just enough to pay off the banker extorting them. See, look, he even gets a hug, just a day after threatening to kick out the family with basically no notice because the dogs annoyed him. Everyone's happy. Now, even though this film doesn't really say anything new as far as the whole dog-human owner possession dichotomy I just went into, I like this because it winds up presenting a similar issue handled in almost the exact same way. Let's present something which we know in the real world is bad, retirees being extorted by banks under threat of homelessness, and then just sort of solve the immediate problem while ignoring the wider systemic issue. In the reality of Beverly Hills Chihuahua, the dogs are beings of human intelligence. By the third movie, they have not only rich social lives, but even jobs and schools much closer to those of people, not dogs. The fact that they are treated like possessions to be bought, sold, and traded, that is a problem established in the films. Chloe being dehumanized and commodified is the main conflict in that first movie but it solves it with Chloe getting away from the bad owners to go back to the good ones. And over here, the problem Sam's family face is abruptly solved by a deus ex machina cash reward. But their actual problem, that their lives are essentially held in the balance by an unsympathetic and exploitative bank, that just ends with, ha, ah, we satiated your greed this time, let's hug it out. In what may seem like the most inoffensive of inoffensive storytelling, what you'd otherwise call apolitical films, there's a kind of underlying attitude of solving immediate individual problems to avoid a much greater systemic one. And I feel 
maybe this could be representative of something. Maybe some kind of dominant ideology in the period the film was made. Just, if you'll hear me out, just, just, just maybe. And let's give a hand to George Lopez, the only person who cared enough to stay for all three Beverly Hills to our films. You did it, George. Great job. That there was still more to his journey. Wait a second. It's the same dog. As I've teased, this odd acceptance of a master-slave hierarchy goes way beyond a one-off late 2000s trilogy, of course, and it's increasingly inseparable from the subgenre of the talking dog film. Once again, we get different ways these films handle, or try to avoid handling, this topic. Various ways these movies attempt to sidestep the reality that, oh, we just wrote a theoretical universe in which humans claim ownership of sentient beings of human intelligence. Hmm. So here's our main categories to explain away the existential horror of this premise. Dogs are actually smarter than us, have their own secret society, and are pretending to suit their own needs. Cats and Dogs was a 2001 film about a young pup named Lou, mistakenly adopted by a family researching a cure to dog allergies, thus embroiling himself in a secret war between the titular cats and dogs. It co-stars Jeff Goldblum, and it's dear to my heart. I watched this one as a kid, you see, and the way it handled animal sentience was always pretty memorable to me. In short, Lou discovers via his stern neighbour Butch that not only have dogs cultivated their own civilization, they're actually smarter than humans and only pretend to serve them to serve their interests. It's like a James Bond film. Which, really, if you were predicting someone like me who was gonna seriously tackle the politics of your movies for seemingly no reason. It's a genius play. Sure, dogs are highly intelligent beings bought and owned by humans to do tricks and entertain them, but aha! The dogs are only pretending, or I guess the liberated dogs are. The fact that Lou and his family didn't know about this stuff would indicate that this secret society kinda just leaves a lot of dogs to live in blissful ignorance that there's a world beyond the servitude of humans. But I digress. It's a smart ploy, Cats and Dogs producers. Now, do you have an answer for the fact that the premise of the film relies on the notion that cats as a race, just in general, must be forcibly oppressed and enslaved to stop them from forming a secret society to enslave humanity? Because you know how that sounds, right? Nothing to say about that? To which you say, aha, clearly someone didn't do their research because in the sequel they fully acknowledge and atone for the bigotry inherent in that premise. To which I say, yes I did. The second film, Cats and Dogs, The Revenge of Kitty Galore, is both way more overt about the more fashy elements of the dog world with openly racist cops and a conflation between all of cat kind and the spread of radical felinism. That's a line from the film. And then, in the end, they join forces with the cat's own global protection force, realising that being the talking dog movie equivalent of anti-Semitic is bad. It's a smarter movie than the first, the creators cared enough to offer constant fan service for viewers of the original, some of the jokes are good, CGI is okay, you know what, the critics that went into this film were clearly biased against it, because it's a damn good film. What was I saying? Dogs as kids. While ownership of human beings is technically illegal in most countries, drawing a parallel between the relationship between man and dog and that of children to their parents is a strong way of dissolving that pesky hierarchy. At least in spirit. You know, the parents are definitely above the kids in terms of authority, and they are legally bound, but it's not like the kids serve the parents. Just like with these dogs, right? This is where you'll get your air buddies, your snow buddies, your space buddies, your super buddies, your spooky buddies, your pretty much, as long as we ignore that at some point a dog as smart as the average human had her pups forcefully taken from her. The dynamic works here. They're not your masters, they're just your daddy. A man getting turned into a dog so that he can remember he's supposed to love his family. Not really a talking dog movie, 
that's a movie about a man in the body of a talking dog. Very different. Dogs are better off enslaved. They're too stupid and lazy to get anything done themselves. Right. So, there's a good chance that when I first started talking about this topic, your own personal hand wave was... Well, yeah, technically in these films the dogs are presented as having human-like intelligence, but they're still mostly just thinking about dog things. And you're right. Aside from outliers that do specifically set up dogs as using their intelligence for some greater purpose, most of the time there's a definite sense that they don't really have much else going on. They might be able to outsmart bank robbers, but they still need that human protection, much like real dogs in the real world. So... I don't really know how to transition this. I was stuck writing this specific part of the script for ages, so I'm just gonna... if I can just... Talking dog movies are almost always neoliberal trash. Smash the system. There is something subtly more complex about the dynamics of the relationship between humans and dogs as established by these movies. Humans do technically have financial control over the dogs, and to some extent control over their day-to-day -day lives, but you know, it's not like the dogs aren't getting anything out of this. In return for their servitude, they get food, shelter, and even cool little accessories. And this is almost always put in opposition to true loss of freedom. Think dog pound, think serial dog nappers, and in the case of Good Boy, think a literal colonial dog empire who are convinced dogs aren't just slaves to humans because like they you. love each other. I think it's friendship. People and dogs live side by side on Earth, and they make a home together. Oh, good boy. You can only get so many points from me just for sneaking that gay representation in there. See, when the dogs are literally just dogs, albeit dogs that are good at basketball, the whole master pet thing, it's, you know, it's not that bad really. But when you add this new conceit in the universe that dogs are as smart as humans, sometimes even can talk to humans, and they're still doing the whole, oh, I love my master, must protect my master thing, it gets a bit... Weird. So you can set up an even worse alternative for the dogs, being literally stuck in a cage all day or sold off to undisclosed nasty men so they can do undisclosed nasty things. But fundamentally, you're not setting up a conflict between control and liberty. It's a conflict between control and... not as overt control. Control that still sees these sentient creatures with limited ability to command their own lives, living on the schedule of the class that has ultimate financial control over them. But we're supposed to just take it as a given that this isn't basically a parasitic relationship. Both sides get what they want, and they actually love and value each other very much. It's not a form of slavery, it's an entirely voluntary reciprocal partnership. Just one in which one side very clearly holds all of the conceivable power, while rarely justifying why they provide what these intelligent beings couldn't provide for themselves. Except, you know, dogs are lazy and stupid. Even if they are as intelligent as people, can we really expect them to feed themselves, shelter themselves? No, no, no. They need our cooperation. In fact, they need to protect us. And if you question this partnership, oh, why are you trying to stir up conflict? Can't we all just get along with this hierarchical structure from which one class of people clearly dominate? It works! As long as we ignore all the ways it doesn't. The effects of incidents like the 2008 housing crisis left thousands upon thousands of families at best in precarious financial situations, at worst homeless and destitute, almost none of this through faults of their own. At current, there are over 500,000 people homeless in the US alone. As Beverly Hills Chihuahua did correctly identify, those suffering most are poor people of colour. Except for most, it isn't just going to be a matter of scampering home to a doting billionaire, nor getting a random $50,000 check from the cops for busting bank robbers, who, incidentally, are also probably desperate people from significantly underprivileged backgrounds. 
I'll bring it down a bit here and say, obviously, again, none of this is about condemning talking dog movies. They're just light-hearted fluff. Cheap and easy to throw out there and keep the kids entertained for a couple of hours. But in watching a lot of these movies on a whim, this was a pattern I saw continuously emerging. Beings given no justified reason to be subordinate to another class of people, unquestioningly devoted to an authority so completely that they will even frame the conflict as one of freedom and domination, even when that freedom is just another form of domination. Because it interests me that we too are kinda living in this extended period whereby we take it on assumption that there needs to be some hierarchical structure, where it's fair for a slim minority to own the overwhelming majority of the economic power out of some vague sense that it's their right to be above us. We act as if the oppressive structure is gone, that it's all free and voluntary, all while aware that once we stop doing the tricks, the fun stops. And as the current economic system leads to ever more unpredictable employment layoffs, companies firing employees for failing to meet arbitrary targets even as they hit record levels of financial success, startups being threatened to constantly expand by investors craving more and more of the pie, it sure does feel like a relevant dynamic right now. And maybe these talking dog movies are kind of representative of the landscape they were made in this way. Or maybe I'm just reading into them that way because that's the world I live in. I can't really say definitively. But one way or another, I can see it. And maybe you can a little bit too. The master-slave relationship that claims to be reciprocal, that we presume we need in the first place. Except... Do we? I don't know. You tell me. I did actually put that in my mouth. I, I know it kind of looked like I was just hiding it, but I did put it in my mouth and it's fucking disgusting. Hey there, folks. Well, oof. That one went some places, didn't it? I really have no idea how people are going to take this one. Hopefully it got your brain thinking about something. <laughs> I look forward to reading thoughts and comments down below. You can also feel free to follow me on Twitter and at me about how silly and what a waste of time that all was. If you did somehow enjoy the video, I would really appreciate if you check me out on Patreon and consider throwing in a couple of bucks to help the show keep going. There's also coffee for one-time donations. Today I have to give out a special thanks to Adam Hall, Evie Rosk, Jimmy Din, Latir, Tor in the Exile, and Cal Rara. I also just wanted to thank anyone who signed up to Skillshare using the link posted in the last video. If you do want to help out the channel for free, you should still be able to use that link for two free months of the service. Or you can also share this video around on Reddit, Twitter, Discord, wherever you like. Next video will be, I don't know, probably the Avatar thing. I keep meaning to get around to that. Also, this is a quick reminder that I have a Twitch channel now where I stream games and Q&A hangouts with viewers a few evenings a week, so I hope you check it out. Link's all down below. Other than that, thanks for watching, have a great week, love you all, and stay safe.